you should create your product and your pitch about the product so well that the person is going, how can I buy this rather than, mm. Hey, you need to buy this so that, you know, when you know, you've done this the right way, the prospect will actually ask you what the next steps are rather than you having to ask them to make the purchase. So why is it so important to use personal stories? That's my first question. And the follow-up question is, where do you start mm. You know, when you work with someone like that? That's a really great, great question. So in the sales process, and especially, again, when you're selling a personal service, health and wellness, um, even a lot of the products, you're de- you're, you are selling to other people, whether it's B2B, B2C, it doesn't matter. It's still another human that is across mm. from you that you're selling to. And so you need to have that human connection with that person. If they don't trust you, if they don't know you, if they don't like you, they're probably not going to buy from you, right? The no like and trust factor. Welcome to episode 146. You could have the best product in the world. If you don't sell it, you have zero business. Entrepreneurs must master the art of selling, even though I hear many of you saying you're not so good at it. Tom Jacobs suggests you start by framing your personal story and use it to connect with your customers. A well-crafted story humanizes the brand and fosters trust, building a bridge of understanding that paves the way for a genuine, long-lasting relationship between you and your clients. Join the conversation as Tom shares tips and strategies for effective selling, how to craft and use personal stories, the role of public speaking in sales, and he discusses his own entrepreneurial bottlenecks. Speaking of which, what's your bottleneck score? Bottlenecks are real and are often hiding from you because you're too busy focusing on the next opportunities. Take the bottleneck index now to identify your potential bottlenecks, their impact on your business, and receive practical solutions to overcome them. You can find the link to this invaluable resource in the show notes. And now let's turn to the interview. Hi, Tom. Thank you for joining me today. No problem. Thanks for having me on the show. So uh, I want to start with a question about, you know, a bit. let's talk some generalities about sale. Because in a world that is more and more digitalized, you know, where mm-hmm. users click on a button or several, so several buttons to buy stuff without interacting with people, and sometimes I feel like, you know, the less companies talk to customers, the better the better they are. You know, yes. what, what's, the, <laughs> what's the place for selling? Yeah, I mean, when, in, in, in my world, because I, I help, you know, health and wellness practitioners uh, with sales. Anytime that there's a real personalized service or a high-end product, mm. it's going to be difficult to just take people through an electronic funnel you know, just have them go to the different video sales pages and regular sales page, and then ultimately purchase uh, a high ticket, you know, something over $2,000 or euros. And um, so you need that additional layer of human to human connection to actually take somebody that might be a little bit interested, but maybe they're afraid of buying it online. They want to actually talk to somebody. So I really don't think the human to human sales is going to go away because that is just kind of ingrained in who we are that before we make a big purchase, we always like to know, like, is it going to work for me? Can it be, you know, whatever the questions are. So Mm -hmm. I I think we can work the automation along with a live salesperson. I've done that many a time so that if somebody doesn't buy online, but they did opt in, now we can trigger a phone call to get them onto a a sales call with the salesperson. Right. So what is your definition of of selling? Of selling? Um, So I I think selling is problem solving. And that's really what a salesperson is. They're a problem solver. But before they become a problem solver, they have to 
be a problem finder at first. So the, the, the biggest part of the sales conversation is always the questioning or the discovery or where, where you're finding out what the problem is. And that is the most important part of the sales conversation. It's interesting because I have the impression you're talking about entrepreneurs here. Because, mm -hmm. you know, that's what entrepreneurs do. They solve problems. That's right. <laughs> yes. So does it mean that all entrepreneurs are supposedly are sales people too? Yeah, well, they have to be. Um, you know, that was kind of my story is when I opened up uh, my fitness business mm. 15 years ago, um, I'd come out of you know, the uh, corporate world and I've been managing millions of dollars in, in freight. But then here I was opening up a small business and I had no earthly idea how to run it. And I had no idea how to sell personal training and, and the other services that we offered. And it was, it became very evident that sales is the number one skill every entrepreneur needs. And it was definitely a skill that I needed. And once I established that skill, then my, my business quadrupled in the next year. Yeah. It was, it was yeah, a huge difference. Yeah. How, how did you learn about it? Well, <laughs> the hard way, of course. <laughs> right. I was, I was almost broke like six yeah. months into owning the business. And, you know, I was, you know, selling 10 sessions at a time. If you buy 10, you get the 11th for free. Yeah. You know, that type of sales technique, just on price. And that will work for people that are, just all in. They've already done the research. They know that they want to work out at this facility. But for those that are kind of on the fence, you need to have a more of a conversation. And I didn't know that. And once I won, I hired a coach. So that was like my number one, a business coach, because clearly I didn't know what I was doing. And mm -hmm. I needed somebody else that had been there and done it before to help me get rid of the scars that, that I was uh, accumulating uh, owning this small business. And through that process, then I started reading a lot of books and really understanding the psychology of sales. Mm -hmm. And especially when you're selling a personalized service, because again, health and wellness, you're talking about some really personal stuff with the prospect and you need to be able to handle that in a very elegant way without sounding salesy, which is, I, I don't like that word salesy, but it describes it pretty well. It's uh, it's funny what you're talking about, just sounding salesy, uh, you know, being too pushy. That's what I like I like to That's call it. Right. But every time I do like a, a sales training course with, with uh, you know, people, I always start by uh, uh, an exercise. I ask them to define what a bad salesperson is. Oh. And they will always come up with so many items on the list, you know, being mm -hmm. pushy, talking too much, not asking questions, etc. And then my next move from there is that, well, now that you know what a bad salesperson is, and we all know, we also know what a good salesperson is. It's the exact opposite of that. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> but it's, it's not so simple. It, yes, but it's not intuitive. It's, no, it's you, you know, it's, it's, this is, and that is something that I really have difficulties to understand is why is it so counterintuitive? Why don't we want to have, why, do, why don't we, you know, understand that sales is really about having conversations with people? Yeah. Well, I think we've been ingrained over the years with, you know, these TV shows and other just the, you know, media and just our experience with salespeople in general in the yeah. past has always been like the, the buyer die, like they're hitting, hitting the prospect over the head with, with the contract, getting them to buy, um, which is not like what I, the type of sales that I do is I call it heart centered selling. Mm -hmm. And that's that you, you don't make somebody buy. You can't because that, I mean, one that's unethical in my book yeah. anyway, and you should, you should, create your product and your pitch about the product so well that the person is going, how can I buy this rather than, mm. Hey, you need to buy this. So that, you know, when you know, you've done this the right way, the prospect will actually ask you what the next steps are. 
rather than you having to ask them to make the purchase. Right. And so I guess this is what you do today, because uh, just to clarify, you, you help business owners, coaches and authors also make more money, what you said, but by using their personal stories. And I yes. think you're starting touching base on that. Yeah. So why is it so important to use personal stories? That's my first question. And the follow up question is, where do you start mm. You know, when you work with someone like that? That's a really great, great question. So in the sales process, and especially, again, when you're selling a personal service, health and wellness, um, even a lot of the products, you're, de- you're, you're selling to other people, whether it's B2B, B2C, it doesn't matter. It's still another human that is across mm-hmm. from you that you're selling to. And so you need to have that human connection with that person. If they don't trust you, if they don't know you, if they don't like you, they're probably not going to buy from you, right? The no like and trust factor. So enable to create that connection with the prospect, a personal story is the perfect avenue to go down to create that connection. Because now you're sharing why you're passionate about this, you know, what you're doing, whether mm-hmm. that's selling a product or delivering a service. You're explaining why you're why you're passionate about it, the story behind that, and when people understand your why, they're going to be a lot more um, motivated to work with you and go, yeah, I totally understand this. I, I get you, and I want to work with them. Right. So yeah. where, where do you start? So let's so, let's let's use let's use me as an example. Like give me give me a free coaching session. Absolutely. <laughs> so. <laughs> The, the very first thing that we always work on is getting a list of all the stories in your life. Not all the stories, but a yeah. good number of stories. And I always preface this with, think about the times where you learn something about yourself or mm-hmm. learn something about others that made a difference in your life. And, it, and you, don't, you don't have to think about your business life either. It could be anything, and we can always relate it back to the business uh, pretty easily. So we get a list of those stories, and then we go down that list and have you actually put yourself back into that situation. Mm-hmm. And the other thing to be careful of is that people always kind of always slant towards the slot side of tragedy. So they always, you know, oh, you know, my near death experience. I have to write that the car crash that I was in. You know, all, all the, you know, the bad things that happen, you don't have to just do the bad things. The, the good stories, the happy moments are, make really great stories as well. So we go through those stories, you put yourself in that situation again. And then what I'm looking for is a physical reaction. So mm. where are you like, you know, getting a little uncomfortable, maybe, maybe I, I see your heart rate going up or you feel your heart rate going up, uh, you're breathing a little bit differently. Uh, maybe shifting around in your seat when you're when you're looking at one particular story, and then you know the next one is like there's no reaction to it. So what I'm looking for are the stories with the most emotional charge for the speaker, and that makes the best story. It also becomes kind of uncomfortable sometimes to share those stories, but they make the best because you have this emotion behind it which can be then conveyed to the uh, your prospect or to your audience in a, in a very compelling way. Yeah, I, I, I understand that. Actually, this is a great lesson for, for all entrepreneurs uh, out there. But in my book of sales, I've learned that it shouldn't always be about you, right? That's right. It's more, it's more about them and your customers. So if you start by your story, then you're talking about you. Then how can you relate to your customers? So there's little techniques that you do as you're telling your story to bring them into the story with you. So it, it's all in how we you know, craft that story and, and design it. Um, I use a framework called the hero's journey. Mm-hmm. And in there, um, you're painting this picture of you as the hero, but in a way that allows the prospect to see themselves in that story and themselves as a hero. And you, you're, using little call outs like well maybe you can relate to this situation and that brings that prospect into the story the the sales process is all about the the prospect you do want to honor that but creating that connection at the very front end of the sales conversation with a personal story can make that make that connection even stronger and keep that prospect really paying attention to you 
Yeah. Do, do you have an example you can share? Make it a bit more practical. Of, of a of, story? Of, of, a, of a story of a client that you helped doing exactly mm -hmm. that, uh, bringing yep. the customers into the, into the personal story? Yeah. So uh, like my own, my own personal story that I use quite a bit is um, the, in, where I almost went broke <laughs> in, in my mm. business. Mm. So, um, you know, I might be talking to other entrepreneurs about sales. I mean, this story is, is really applicable for anything. It's, you know, I can use it for motivational uh, talk in terms of getting people to take an action. Um, I can talk about sales and how you create these stories uh, or you create the, the process of, of selling better. But I always I start the story off with with this. So there I was Sunday afternoon sitting in the back of my gym in the office, which shared with the electrical closet. So there's a transformer right behind me. It was super hot. It was Sunday afternoon. It was a beautiful day in, in, in Houston. Blue skies, a little humid, but really nice day. But I'm here in the back on a Sunday afternoon and I'm looking at my computer screen and tears start coming down my face. And I realized at that point, as I was staring at my computer screens and looking at my bank account, that I was going to be $10,000 short on Friday to pay payroll and rent. And I didn't know what I was going to do. So that's how we start off the story. Mm. <laughs> right? And then people are like, oh, that's, that's interesting. And then I go into that it was because of sales, because I didn't know how to sell, that I was almost broke. And then the turnaround of, you know, getting the, getting a loan from my father uh, for $10,000, getting over that hump, but also investing in myself and investing in a coach that would help me make sure that I didn't have these blind spots anymore. Right. I, I understand. Yeah. Uh, so then how I relate that to selling a, a sales coaching program is like, you know, that was the route that I went down. I got a coach. You should get a coach too. Yeah, it makes I agree. A, it's a really nice correlation, right? <laughs> it's, it's like perfect. I, I agree. That is yeah. that is uh, very very interesting. I think I think for myself, you know, all the stories I could create <laughs> following yeah. following your model. Um, mm -hmm. You you're also on the edge of uh, public speaking, right? I think I think you also help people do some public speaking. Yes. Do, what's is there a correlation between sales and public speaking but because for me it's 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 like sales is like public speaking it's it's you have to be good at public speaking if you want to be good at sales absolutely so i look at the public speaking where you are selling something from the stage so right. um rather than just giving a presentation that's that's one skill set of public speaking which is great you need to know how to do that but the there it's a whole nother skill set to now bring in how are you going to sell from the stage? And so we work together to come up with the stories, the teaching moments, and then ultimately at the end is the pitch to get people to purchase. And it's it's actually the same process as yeah, a one-on-one -on -one sale. Yeah. yeah, it works so, on, on both. So should entrepreneurs learn public speaking or should, should they learn sales or both? They should learn both, absolutely. The the one marketing tactic that I used, and I didn't do it consistently, I should have, but the one that created the best return on investment was when I did public speaking. I mm. Every time that I went and I did a lunch and learn, whether it was to two people or to a hundred people, I always made sales. And you know, it's, it's, and it, it didn't cost me anything. It cost me you know, an hour of time to go in or two hours of time to go to somebody's office and do a, do a talk, but I always made a sale and it was, it was so easy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And I, I grew a business around public speaking. Yeah. And we're going back to the conversation we had at the beginning of the importance of talking, talking to people, because when you're on stage, you are giving opportunities for people to talk to you right? Absolutely. and to understand yep. you and to understand you better. Hence the importance, mm -hmm. the importance of starting with your personal stories. Absolutely. hundred percent. Great. Love it. I, I love it also. So, you know, there are, there are a lot of uh, public speakers and the best one, they, they, they can talk about nothing for hours. It's, it's beautiful. How good they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
and, and when you when you break that down too, and yeah. I love going to different events just to see public speakers, and especially if they're selling from the stage, because I love seeing what other people are doing and or not doing, you know. Yeah. And and just to pick up on how they're you know, working around, and and all of them, all the really good ones always tie in a story through their entire presentation, and it's a seamless end where you're pulling out your credit card and you're buying something. It's, mm. And it, it it just seems like one continuous talk that ends in a sale. And it, it's so beautiful. Mm. Do you have any, any anybody you could uh, recommend for the audience to follow? To, to watch? Um, yeah, to watch. Yeah, this. I mean, some, some of the big names, you know, you go to a Tony Robbins event. And that mm. is, you know, it's UPW, Unleash the Power Within, which is like a four-day event. And I think it's day three. Well, they're selling throughout the entire event. So if you're really like dissecting everything that happens from the moment you register, you are being primed to purchase something mm. else other than what you just purchased. So what's the next step? Um, and it and it's not in a sleazy way. And I don't want people to think that, you know, you know don't go to Tony Robbins because they're going to sell something to you. You go to any event. And they should be selling something to you. That's the whole purpose of, of a lot of these events is great. We've helped you with this little problem. Now, now you probably have another problem that needs to be solved. Come join us for this other program. Right? Mm. The, 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 people get mad when you, they get pitched at an event. But I think it's like it's a good service to then offer people the next step if they want to take it. So yeah. you know, Tony Robbins is really, really great. Uh, Brandon Bouchard is amazing uh, with that. Those are two in the public uh, or in the uh, personal development space. I will tell you though, uh, one that I saw that just absolutely crash and burn and it and it just broke my heart to watch, watch mm. this guy crash and burn. I was in London and I went to an event with uh, the Wolf of Wall Street mm -hmm. and um, Jordan Belfort. And he was, he did a great presentation, but then when he got to the pitch, it just completely fell apart because okay. he was trying to, it, it was, it, you could tell that he was just pushing a little bit too much and mm -hmm. people started to get up and leave. And then he was like, why, why is everybody leaving? This is the best part. <laughs> it's like, well, no, you're, you're selling to me now and I can feel like you're selling to me. Yeah. And, and so people just did not like that at all. Yeah. So that's he the thing. The best, sold. so the best salespeople and public speakers, you should not feel that like they're selling something to you. You should still yeah. get value from the event that you yeah. went to, but at the end you'd be like, gosh, I want some more. Yeah. And then, yeah, you get, you get to make that choice yourself without feeling like you're being pressured to do something. Great insights. All right. Now let's talk a little bit about you, the entrepreneur. Okay. You're also, you're also an entrepreneur, right? Yes. <laughs> Why did you become an entrepreneur is my first question. Uh, it's just in my DNA, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, from a from a young uh, age, like I had my own paper out at a, you know, when I was really little. And then uh, in high school, I had a DJ business and a string quartet where we do weddings and homecomings and stuff like that. And I always had something on the side. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my parents weren't necessarily entrepreneur, entrepreneurs uh, um, either. Uh, so I'm not sure where I where I picked that up, but it was just I think it was just part of me. I wanted that freedom and and not work for somebody else. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm one of the worst employees that somebody could ever hire because I'm always like thinking the next step of like what can we do next, what can we do better, mm -hmm. and not a lot of employers like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it's, this is like I said, you're a good, uh, you're a good illustration of that. It's entrepreneurship is a calling. Mm, but that's absolutely. what you said. It was in your DNA. Yeah, yeah I yeah. really believe this is true. Yeah. And so that entrepreneurship journey. Um, what are some of the uh, some of the lessons, like the the you know the really hard lessons? What was sales? We already know about. But the other hard lessons you learn along along the way that you can you can share with others. Yeah. Well, don't do it alone. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, it's so lonely. Like none of my friends, when I, when I went all in on the fitness business and that was the first business that I didn't have a safety net, like mm. I, all the other businesses that I started, I always had a, a full-time job that supported me, but this one, 
you know, I quit the full-time job and then opened up my fitness business. And it was very lonely because none of my friends owned businesses. And, you know, when I would talk to them about the hours and like, oh yeah, but you own your own business. It's so great for you. You can go in and out whenever you want. I was working 15 hours a day, <laughs> like yeah. stuck in this one place. It was like, oh, and yeah. that's the, that's number one after sales is know that you're not alone and get in with other entrepreneurs, get into some group, whether it's a mastermind or a networking group or just a support group for the, yeah. for anything where you're talking to other entrepreneurs on a regular basis, because that'll just up your game. Yeah, totally, totally agree. And this is a good transition into my next my next question, which is about being the bottleneck, because I asked you to take the bottleneck index and you did very good. You had a score of 36 percent, which is like really nice. But I studied yeah 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 but on delegating especially specifically you scored the lowest with 50 percent. is that an accurate view of uh, you today i you know the higher the number the worse right yes yeah yeah so i believe that that 50 percent is a drastic improvement than oh, where i was oh. maybe like five years ago okay. absolutely because, you know, I always had that mindset of if you want it done right, do it yourself. And that's if you want it done right. Now, my mindset is if you want it done right, document the process and give it to somebody else to do and then mm -hmm. monitor the process. So, that, I mean, I still struggle, though, yeah. <laughs> clearly, if I'm at 50 yeah. percent delegating. <laughs> because so it, we'll just... Sometimes it's just quicker for me to do it, but I stop myself and I go, do I need to be doing this? Or do I need to rely on my team to be able to do this and understand how to do it? And so I will stop. I will write out the process if one isn't already there and give it to a team member to to fulfill on. Yeah. The, one of the way one of the way I assess that part of the delegation is by asking a question, are your employees depending on you to, to take mm -hmm. actions? And this is yeah. where you scored the highest. Mm -hmm. Uh, apparently your employees are still very much depending on you <laughs> before yeah. they can before they can move on so would you say this is your biggest bottleneck today is that Absolutely. the inability to delegate yeah 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 delegate yeah. and then trust that the employees and i think it, it comes back to maybe my hiring and mm. and making sure that i have the right people in the organization to do the right jobs and I and I I think I struggle a little bit with that because hiring has never been like a fun thing for me to do because it just seems like a, a chore. Um, but uh, I think I am getting uh, much better in my old age. <laughs> it's wisdom. <laughs> wisdom, that's right. I, but how did you become? <laughs> how, how have you become better? What 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 are sort sort of the the, the practical actions you've taken? So um, one is documenting the processes that we have. Yeah, and so just and and making sure that they know how to get to the processes. So just I mean this this seemed like a no brainer to me, but you know I it it was a problem where I put all the documents into Google into a Google Drive. And all the process documents were in there. And we even had a spreadsheet that linked to the different process documents. But nobody was going there to find the process. So they would go to their coworker and ask them a question. The coworker would give them an answer and maybe it worked, maybe it didn't. And then ultimately they would come to me and say, oh, Tom, how do I do this? And then I would show them the process. And I was like, well, here it is. Like, why didn't you go there first? Oh, I didn't know it was there. It just it was too difficult. So mm -hmm. we implemented an online knowledge base and where all the process documents are are in right now. And I don't get calls anymore. <laughs> it's so great. So they're able to get to and then I mean, it took a good six months to transition and change the behavior because it's yeah. so much. I mean, it's so easy to just go to a coworker and say, hey, how do you do this? Or, hey, Tom, how do you do this? and then get the quick answer versus, you know, now I say, well, go to screen steps and, and find the answer for yourself. I'm not going to tell you the answer because yeah. I know it's there. If it's not yes. there, then request that we create a process 
for yes them. because then by not answering all the requests it also it also uh, empowers them a little bit make them accountable and also allows you to focus on what matters most because you have yes. other things to do yeah right. like writing processes when they're not when they're not in place for instance for yeah. instance exactly yeah any 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 other things that uh, you have um, you have any other actions you have you have taken um so documenting the process is like number one and then allowing employees to fail and and mm. and making that a part of the of the culture of the company is it's okay it's okay to make mistakes because that's when we learn i didn't yell at myself for you know or maybe i did yell at myself for making some big mistakes in the business um therefore like i don't but i learned from that mistake and therefore now when an employee makes a mistake you know if if it's you know there was no process and there was really no direction, but they were trying something, I'm going to reward them for trying and failing than not trying at all. Yeah. That's that's like my biggest pet peeve is when somebody doesn't know how to do something and then they just do nothing. They don't even try. Mm. Well, you know, you're going to fail 100% of the time when you do nothing. Nothing's going to happen. But maybe you succeed if you try something and maybe you fail, but you learn something. You learn exactly. what works or what doesn't work. Exactly. What's the big dream for your business? My big dream? Yeah, if you have one. I do. Uh, it's to get to 100 clients. Uh, so I have uh, a couple related businesses, but the one where we're doing follow-up and appointment setting for uh, leads, uh, I want to get to 100 clients in the next uh, six months. We're about halfway there. How many How many uh, staff do you employ in total? I have 17 right now. To achieve your big dream, can you do it? Without you know improving at delegate delegation, no, I have to be, get better at delegating, hundred hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. How would you how would you do it? I'm asking a coaching question here. Oh. <laughs> how would I get better at delegating? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's recognizing when I should be delegating versus just doing something. So that's the number one is to obviously rec recognize that there's a problem, right? And then. It's just once I'm able to recognize it, then I'm going to see it on a regular basis. Like, oh, okay, I don't need to do this. I need to pass this on to one of the team members to do. Mm. And now with the, some of the technology that we have, it's like really easy. Like I'll record a, a quick Loom video showing what needs to be done and then poop, put it up, give it to somebody else. And then they create the process based on the Loom video that I created. Yeah. So I'm spending less time and teaching them at the same time. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. I wanted to ask you because it's such an important topic for entrepreneurs. This is yeah. one of the most common bottlenecks that I see, you know, keeping the control, not, not delegating. This is so, mm -hmm. so, so common that yeah. I'm happy you, you share a little bit about <laughs> your experience and how you're going to get out of the bottleneck. <laughs> That's right. And, and I'll tell you what, too, for entrepreneurs, if you don't have your processes, if you're not delegating, and you want to sell your business, it's going to be really difficult to get a good price if you don't have processes and procedures in place and you've all but removed yourself from the business. Because yeah. the value of the business is all in not having you do everything. Because once you sell the business, you're not going to be there anymore. Indeed. Great point. Great point. All right. This question, I think I already know the answer, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Uh, if you take all your experience, uh, and summarizes it into one practical recommendation for all the entrepreneurs or wannabe entrepreneurs, what would it be? Learn to sell. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, or this is coming from an, an introverted person who hated yeah. to sell all of his life. Like, yeah. you know, I was programmed from an early age that salespeople were bad that they just want to make a sale and then go away. And it, that's clearly not not the case, mm -hmm. especially for heart-centered salespeople. You're in it for the long term. You're selling something to somebody that you're now in a relationship with as a customer and a, and a provider of a service. So you better make sure that that sales process feels good for both parties. Yeah, win-win situations, absolutely. Yep. All right, great. One last question. 
how can people contact you? So um, my website is probably the best place to go. So it's tomjacobs.com. And that's J-A-C-K-O-B-S, just like it says, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then if you put a slash storybook at the end of that URL, then I will send you my workbook on how to craft craft your own personal story. Amazing. Thank you very much, Tom, for your You're time today. Welcome. Absolutely. This was fun. And thank you for listening. I hope you found the insights and tips shared by Tom today very helpful, especially to tackle your own bottlenecks. So don't forget to tune in next time for more inspiring stories. Now, see you in the next episode. Bye for now.